our most vital relationship is, of course, that with our Lord Jesus the Christ. We want everyone to have the blessing and the benefit that comes from being in God's family as part of that redeemed child, member of heaven on earth. And because of being connected to a divine institution, God, heaven born and blood bought, we have a blessing that the world just doesn't know. We want everyone to know that. And this is why our mission is in a crafty st uh, statement uh, from the Great Commission, the Lord's Great Commission, equipping disciples to make new disciples. Would you say that with me again? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. That's what we're all about, folks, as we live the Christian life. And as his family... We do experience a type of heaven on earth, but not everyone has the blessing of such influence. You've heard the phrase before, with friends like that, <laughs> who needs enemies? In contrast to last week's lesson, which I prefer, since it was much more positive and optimistic and future outlook of things that are good, we're going to today, today look at present tense conditions that are not so good. Today, we're going to look at the kinds of relationships that are only a blessing if we avoid. This lesson resulted from different motivations and also different resources, and so to help us prepare our minds for the lesson points, I want to share, for the majority of our introduction and lesson, a few statistics from a book called Point Man and Similar Works by Steve Farrar. It's a great book as we all focus on the family. I encourage you to have it in your library. It's been out for several years. Statistics can become dated, but the points are very current. And some portions are not easy to read, especially when you realize that some things have not gotten any better. Some things perhaps have gotten even worse. So enjoy, if there is possible to enjoy, let your mind be challenged by some of these statistics as I read. Tonight, enough teenagers to fill the Rose Bowl, Cotton Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and Orange Bowl, Fiesta Bowl, and the average Super Bowl I can't imagine not that number, will practice prostitution to pay for drug addictions. One million teenage girls will conceive a child before marriage this year. 500,000 of those babies will never be born, and you know why. 40% of all 14-year-old girls will have had some type of sexual experience before the age of 19. 60% of all church-involved teenagers are pre presently sexually active. 66% of American high school seniors have used illegal drugs. And every 78 seconds, a teenager in America attempts suicide. Church, we've got a lot of work to do. It's natural for Christians who care to feel so overwhelmed that they will state preventative statements. In other words, you hear things like this. If God's design for the home had defined America the past 30 years, these numbers would be nowhere close to that. And that's true. Absolutely true. Millions have grown up in homes and environments where God's word is neither taught nor practiced. But the church hasn't picked up the slack too well. My generation doesn't know much about the Bible, biblical illiteracy is a huge problem, and teaching them is our responsibility. Many young people are presently struggling. What do we do to fix the problem? Presently struggling and are essentially asking for disaster and destruction because of the counsel they are both hearing and accepting. I wonder, where is this bad advice coming from? And why or how is it being so readily accepted? Good questions. 
Assuming a child leaves home at the age of 20 or so, by the age of 10, which seems so young, by the age of 10, parents will have spent one out of every two consecutive days with their child. That's shocking. But even more shocking is that the average family unit today spends only a few hours each day together. And if you're talking about interaction, face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact and communication, it's even far worse. Isn't it true that those that we are most influenced by are those we spend most time with? Parents are very wise to know their children's friends because on normal days for most teens, they spend more time with their friends. Oh, and frankly, many studies focusing on church-involved teens or teens with religious parents aren't too encouraging either. And there are many reasons as to why. You can fill your bookshelves with reasons as to why. But I stress today this point, and, and it's a side note to parents, many need to be reminded how important it is not just to think that because you're in a role you deserve this, but to earn, to earn the role of being your child's most influential spiritual guide. And here's why. Somewhere along the line, friends are giving friends bad advice. Even religious teens are susceptible to this. For example, God's word is pretty clear on the blessing of physical intimacy to be enjoyed with even all the spiritual blessings to come when in the confines or the the role of marriage. God is clear on that. But one study concluded that, brace yourself for this statistic, and good research, good resource, 95% likelihood, with a likelihood of 95%, the number one predictor as to whether or not a teenager will fornicate, become sexually active, before marriage is if his or her two closest friends are also sexually active in their lives. So if you read that, you think, well, well, where do they go to church? Who are the elders? Who's the minister? It doesn't matter. If you're around two of your closest friends, most often, whose lifestyles reflect how they think differently than how a Christian should, That's the stronger influence, 95% of the time. Every day, friends are giving friends bad advice. What type of counsel are they hearing every day? Well, you've seen this list before. I, I thoroughly enjoyed sharing this lesson with you, a whole service time on these eight points and the statements that people make and the type of standards that they are appealing to. Everyone's doing it as if the majority is right. Only if no one gets hurt, Look into the crystal ball and see what the results will be from breaking God's rule. I'm the exception, of course. My life, it's my life. Really? Well, is yourself the standard? It's for a good cause. So situation ethics. Times are changing. Peers? I don't do it very often. Is it frequency matters? No one see me or saw me do it. (laughs) I feel okay about it. On and on and on you go. Basically, just do what you want. This is the type of counsel that the world is living by, and it's scary because you and I, as innocent living beings, indigenous from their uh, bad decisions, could suffer the consequences from that. God's people think differently and are tremendously spiritually blessed for this. All the more reason to live. Here is a most disturbing statistic. And it preaches hard, not just to parents, but to every Christian who do not presently take their spiritual walk seriously. I mean, very seriously. And it's this. By a 91 margin percent, the number one predictor that teens will suffer from adolescent at-risk behavioral problem is, is if religious standards 
are not consistently practiced in the home. In other words, if your son or daughter believes that you as a parent say one thing at the worship services, but then go home and live completely differently, that's a recipe for disaster. But the question is how? How does a parent's double life result in this for the teen to act that way? There are many answers as to why. You can fill your bookshelves with books that talk about different aspects, but key word, I think, is disrespect. When disrespect occurs, children who do not respect their parents foster resentment over time and then turn, well, they may not understand what's happening, but it's natural to then turn to the value system of your peers, your friends, because they have a, a, an era of acceptance and support. And of course, I've heard it said that shared trials bring people closer together. Regardless if the advice is good or bad, it's more easily accepted from those that you consider to be your friend. In the adult world, you and I, we struggle always with not only doing right, but doing right consistently. And I know that people make excuses, to, or they're just looking for excuses to not do what's right. We're not talking about them. But the question is, how many would be in church today if Christians had resolved to always do their best to try to only behave like Christ all the time? It's important for every Christian to strive to be a better role model for Christ and for parents to earn, again, earn that respect of being the spiritual guide. People want to belong somewhere, and people of any age will look, and they will find somewhere to belong, some type of identity, subgroup, subculture, group, whatever. They will look, they will find, because we've got to have that feeling of identity and belonging. <clears throat> it is vital for us to reach out, like our mission statement mentions, because people do not yet know outside of Christ. They do not yet know the one support group that they will be eternally blessed by once they are a part of it, and that is the church. People need the Lord. So now let's notice briefly some points of top of friend friendships we are to avoid, or associations, of course. We should avoid those people who say, it doesn't matter. There is no right or wrong. Just do it. When you are tempted to do what is wrong, that's a temptation, obviously, some people just might be placed along your path that will tell you what you want to hear for instant gratification and will not tell you the consequences. <laughs> do what you feel like. There's a tragic story in 2 Samuel 13. I will briefly mention this next week in our lesson, but for today, then, let's focus on some details. A man named Jonadab was an ungodly friend to a man named Amnon. Now, Amnon was already a very selfish and ungodly person. He has many passions that are misdirected. He had enough sense to resist for a while. He needed good advice, but it was his buddy, so-called buddy, whose advice removed all reserve, and nothing but disaster was the result for not only him and obviously for her, but the whole kingdom. In the account, Amnon has a very lovely half-sister, Tamar. His passions are strong, wrongfully directed toward her. His lust is so strong that he becomes physically ill and mentally anguished. I think he also had some mental struggles, uh, as I would try to imagine this. But, but this man needs help. And Amnon is selfish, yes, but Jonadab's ungodly advice was exactly what he did not need to hear. Jonadab has, well, he's a crafty man. He's obviously used this type of reasoning for his own life. He encourages Amnon to carry out a plan to get what he wants, to ignore the consequences, and to choose to go against family, against the law, and against ultimately the Lord by making him believe it's okay. It doesn't matter. Think of who you are. The laws don't apply to you. Break the rules. It even seems like he was able to get Amnon to think that the king wouldn't find out that's the nature of temptation and sin, isn't it? Wrong friends give reasons that sound good, but not good sound reasoning. So regrettably, Amnon takes Jonadab's ungodly advice, takes Tamar by force. Consequently, 
reveals the true nature of this passion and not only does it cost him his love for her if it was ever to be argued to be there in the first place but also his life for, for this sinful deed it's doubtful Amnon would have it's arguably doubtful that Amnon would have followed through with this if Jonadab had said something like this you're being blinded to think that this passion of lust is love but don't you know that the king will eventually find out the status of his daughter? This could disrupt all of Israel and cost you your life. But instead, he persuades him with reasons that sound good to get what you want. You are the king's son. Oh, I'm an exception. Wow. Mm. Whoever you are, whoever you are, God's moral commands apply. So each of us struggle with our interests and our priorities always natural but especially when our desires and our our feelings are reinforced with reasons that sound good watch out with friends who influence you to think and do whatever you feel like you don't need enemies let's shift gears and look at another point there's another kind of friend and we'll begin just simply by looking at Matthew 14 first verses 1 through 12 and we've had lessons before on John the baptizer who at that time, Herod the, uh, the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, in the terrified voice, no doubt, this is John the Baptist, he's risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, an important side note, his brother Philip's wife, <laughs> and also his half-sister, because John had said to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. It's not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death for this, telling the, you know, him, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, who do you invite to your birthday parties? Okay. The daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. The daughter of Herodias, his brother is Philip's wife and half-sister. This is the man's niece, great niece. Therefore, his, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might want. So she, who is she, having been prompted by her mother, the woman who heard that John says, I, I, you know, I can't be with you. I can't, I can't do what I want. Oh, boy. Give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. And verse 9, the king was sorry. I might attach a few other connotations to that word sorry, but you can imagine he was very mournful over this. But nevertheless, now is this a type of honorable, honorable man that if he had said it to no one that he would have followed through with this? So because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. Skip a few verses. Then his disciples came and took the body and told, buried and told Jesus. I love talking about John the baptizer, the forerunner of Christ. He's so fearless. He tells Herod, it's not sinful for you to have your brother's wife and half-sister. Herod puts him in prison. He wants to kill him, but because of the multitudes loving John, fearing him, He's afraid to do this, so he's afraid. I want to stress that again. Why, then, is this deed eventually done to do what he initially was scared to do? Herod's birthday, his, his relative dances in a way that pleases him. He makes a rash promise, promised by an e pro let's say, prompted by an evil spirit in Herodias. She requests John's death. Verse 9 is the key. The king was very grieved and sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and those who sat with him, shall I say, his friends? First kind of friend to avoid is those who say it doesn't matter. Second kind to avoid are those who matter too much. In application, if a friend's opinion of the choices you're making to please God is so burdensome 
on your soul that it costs you or causes you, prompts you to compromise or change what you know to do is right, then that friend does matter too much. I think about Jesus' proverbial question, Matthew 10, I believe, the, uh, who, who do you love most? Who do you really love most? How many people are refusing to put Christ on in baptism because of a relative or a friend? Who do you love most? Joshua, in chapter 24, verse 15, asked for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We have no indication that Herod ever made that choice, but rather he was always choosing his way, and it only brought disaster and death. He put to death, and think of it, he put to death the one who prepared the way for the Lord because of his comrades, his friends. As powerful as that point is, let's move on briefly to the third and final. This sounds a little different, but we're going to approach the same topic from a different way. Avoid friends who use covert attempts. Uh, there's no other way to word this. Uh, basically, friends who mask the consequences. They don't tell you. You know, a temptation to do wrong is stronger when the consequences are hidden. And they're saying, don't look over here, look over there. Look at the bait in that trap. Don't look at what will happen afterwards. If you want to, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I love the reading of this by Scott earlier. Really appreciate that. Evil companionship or company corrupts good habits or morals. I love this passage so much. I've heard it quoted my whole life, and you have probably too, dozens and dozens of times, without the context being even referenced. I found that very interesting. Someone would ask me, when I, I think when I moved to Florence, I was 21, I guess, I moved to Florence, and I thought, I never, I, I don't know the context of 1 Corinthians 15. I'll never forget. Verses 1 through 11 speaks about Christ being risen and the reality of our faith. Then verses 12 through 19, Christ is our present hope of an eternity that will take place. We will have that, we have that promise of eternity in heaven because of that. Verses 20 uh, through 28 speaks about the death that he conquered and the death for us as our last enemy, which will be destroyed. And then verses 29 and following, Paul wraps up his argument. But, but the whole chapter is about the resurrection. How can a statement in verse 33 relate to a subject about the resurrection? Verses 29 through 30, Paul is simply asking, if the dead don't rise, why are we following Christ and even suffering for it? And then he says in verse 31, if the dead do not rise, let's think and behave like everyone else. Do whatever you want because death ends it all. In other words, do what you want no matter the consequence because nothing matters. That's what they're saying. That's what they think. A different philosophy entirely, lest it be in any way thought and perceived too long, Paul quickly says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. The type of company we're talking about today. He says, awake to righteousness. Do not sin, for some shamefully still do not have the knowledge of God, and by now they should. So, this phrase is in a context not about overtly sinful deeds, that's the effect, but the cause is based in what people think, based in what people think, how they look at life. The Christian views life completely differently. They have a different set of values and, and an outlook that changes their decisions and influences everything that they do. So over time, if you're hanging around the wrong people, they can sway your mind. Those who say it doesn't matter, those who matter too much <laughs> and those who use well those who covertly corrupt our logic can totally destroy our relationship with Christ as well so in conclusion what a blessing to have Christian friends Christian family they are and they want to be we all want to be a source of godly comfort and good counsel to do what's right for your soul, and thankfully through good times and bad. I'd like to conclude with 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, as you see the gospel's obedient faith response enacted and visualized, illustrated. Paul reminds us that the trials of this life 
are temporary. You know, you can put up with a lot in a temporary setting. The trials of this life are temporary, but the rewards of heaven are eternal. So in all of this, what's the application point for us and the people that we choose to be around to help us in this decision that we're going to make to put on Christ and to live for him faithfully? Do not, do not give up your Christian faith. Keep walking in the light of the Lord and to do so, so more fervently to help those come to Christ who desperately need him as well. Sure, we will influence others as we contact the world, but make sure they don't influence you to turn your back on Christ. Follow him every day and put him on in baptism if you need to as we stand and as we sing.